Welcome to Conversations That Count. I am Shreelekha Pali, Vice Chair of Strategy and Community Engagement for Fairfax GOP. Thank you for joining us. The goal of Conversations That Count is to bring in experts that can eloquently present to us the facts so we can make the right decisions concerning the issues that face you and me and all our communities. One of those pressing issues that we discuss all along in our communities is about the current climate change and economic policies associated with it. Political groups remain divided over climate change costs and policies. Partisan divisions remain when it comes to how Americans perceive the effects of climate change policies on the environment and the economy. While speaking of economy, things in the world have gotten really ugly. Stocks are crashing, inflation and gasoline prices are soaring. Poor and fixed income families face growing hardships. Putin's barbaric war in Ukraine rages on and it continues. And violent criminals and illicit drugs stream into America along with millions of undocumented immigrants. But amid this, all these crises, what surprises me is Team Biden remains laser focused on man-made climate change. Why do you think that is the case? Let's explore this with our next guest, Craig Rucker on Conversations That Count. Craig is the co-founder and president of CFAC. For those of you that have not heard about the organization, it is called as the Committee for a Constructive Tomorrow. It's a free market think tank devoted to sound science for both people and the planet. In 1985, CFAC was founded to promote a much needed positive alternative voice on issues of environment and development. Its co-founders, David Rothbard and Craig Rucker, who is here with me, strongly believe the power of the market combined with the application of safe technologies could offer humanity practical solutions to many of the world's most pressing problems. A number of leading scientists, academics, and policy leaders soon joined them, along with thousands of citizens from around the US and the world. I'm very thankful that Craig Record decided to take some time this evening and join us on Conversations That Count. Craig, welcome to Conversations That Count. Thank you, Sri. It's a pleasure to be on, and your check will be in the mail for that very generous beginning. You're very welcome. I'll take it. Inflation is soaring, so I'll take any check you can provide me. <laughs> so. Uh, Craig, CFAC, uh, as I very well know about it, is a respected Washington, D.C.-based organization whose voice can be heard relentlessly, infusing the public interest debate with a balanced perspective. I think that's what I truly enjoy. It has a balanced perspective on environmental stewardship and other important issues. My question to you is, how did all this get started? What made you get up one night and say, I'm just going to do this? <laughs> <coughs> well... I know it's a surprise. I mean, I look so young, uh, but we started this back in 1985 when I was uh, not long. I did a little stint in the military and also in college. And really what struck me unusual is I grew up in a rural upstate New York area. I mean, we heated our home with firewood. We hunted. And uh, when I went to college uh, after all this, I realized a lot of those people said uh, they were uh, I went to an upstate New York college called Albany. Many were from New York City and couldn't tell you the difference between a, a maple tree and a chestnut tree, but uh, they were telling me that I wasn't a good environmental steward, that I didn't know what I was talking about. And uh, I said, that's very odd because most of the people that are from the rural areas, if you look nationwide, where are the areas that vote Republican are the red areas? They're places from the country quite mm -hmm. often. They're the people closest to nature. And it dawned on me that, you know, this is a type of thing that I think has been co-opted by those on the left, that they claim to represent the environment, that they know about the environment, and really they don't reflect the views of those who are closest to it. So we wanted to get a group of citizens and scientists and academics who shared uh, kind of uh, common sense, Western values, and uh, didn't uh, have this save the earth mantra where they valued the lives of animals over people and had this idea that nature was like a Disney movie. Basically, uh, you know, everything's in perfect harmony. And that, no, nature's, uh, you know, vicious, cold, and cruel at times too. And it needs to be managed or stewarded. And uh, so we formed this organization to be a common sense voice on environmental issues. 
So Craig, I, I really am enjoying what I'm hearing. Common sense is a word that is not so common anymore. Environmental stewardship and having a balanced approach. So I, I'm glad that you got started with this organization. Let me ask you also about the, uh, you held the primary responsibility for building Collegians program. I hope I'm saying that right on more than 40 yes. campuses across the country. And they have attended and you brought the teams of student delegates to UN conferences in Kyoto, Copenhagen, Cancun, Montreal, and many more. Um, I think the reason I really wanted to uh, pose this question is this is quite an accomplishment considering that campuses usually don't encourage alternative thoughts. Uh, so how are you able to accomplish that? I mean, that's, that's kind of significant. You just really need to get some kudos for that. Oh, well, thank you very much, Sri. I was going to say that the Collegians program has really been around since the early uh, 2000s. Um, I myself back, and this goes back quite a few years, was very active on the campus activism front for conservative causes. And uh, it was, a, you know, bad back then, but it's even worse today uh, with the political correctness in that that is going on. So we started this uh, as an effort to try and reach out to young people and it's just grown phenomenally. We have chapters on dozens and dozens of campuses across the country. Um, Adam Hauser is our collegians coordinator. He does a lot of speaking and organizing. Really, we like our collegians program uh, to be, we call it salt and pepper. We do like to call out the greens, and that would be the pepper uh, portion, and uh, some of the things that we talk about, because uh, uh, we have to protest, let's say, Al Gore, or we have to, when there's a speaker on the left, uh, make sure that we tell them what that what they're saying isn't correct. Uh, sometimes we get involved in protests and things of that sort. We have our young people do that. They enjoy that. That's fun. But we also want to do the uh, sugar and spice and everything nice thing, which is the uh, uh, salt or sugar side, which is actually do environmental pickups. Like we'll have our students uh, actually clean up a campus. Imagine that, an environmental group that actually works to clean up the campus instead of trying to shut down a coal plant. Uh, they'll go out on nature hikes. They'll bring in speakers that actually talk about real conservation needs and problems. And so we try to do things that both protect nature, give people a positive venue. You can't just attack all the time what the other side is doing. You have to replace it with something that's constructive and positive. Uh, that uh, that's kind of unheard of anymore, right? If you don't dis you don't agree, you go and attack or you want to raise protests. So it's kind of nice to see they're doing something that is constructive and productive for the environment. Uh, so Craig, can you talk to me about this creation of model demonstrations, eco projects uh, in impoverished villages in Asia, Latin America, and Africa? As you know, I come from an Indian. I'm an Indian immigrant. I've been here for a little over two decades, uh, but I'm always uh, curious to know what kind of um, environmental stuff that's going on out there. Because as you know, China and uh, India are someone that we really need to kind of work with them to get through this uh, environmental crisis. So have these eco projects received well in this? developing countries? Uh, yes, they have. As a matter of fact, one of our uh, uh, proud accomplishments, kind of like our collegians program, and in fact, it inspires a lot of our young people, is uh, it's not enough to just, as I said, criticize the left, but we have to go out and show how it's properly done. Uh, if the left deserves credit for anything, it's for raising issues that sometimes the right ignores. And one of them is poverty and things that are going on in other countries. So uh, the problem is the left doesn't really give solutions that are going to help people. It's usually handouts, welfare, make, make people dependent on things. So we wanted to show how free market uh, capitalism can actually work to improve the environment and uh, show stewardship and property rights are things that can work. Uh, we've been doing this for about 20 years. We have programs in places like Uganda, for example, where we've started businesses and we train entrepreneurs how to manage pig farms, pineapple farms. Uh, we've also done uh, um, efforts in your native country of India. This year, we've uh, funded the development of clean water, a well that went into a, an Indian village that's in an impoverished area of India. We did that last year and the year before. Um, working in partnership with some NGOs that are on the ground. Uh, we've also worked uh, to save lions in Tanzania, uh, right. where in fact, uh, a lot of the locals there are killing the lions because they're eating their cattle. So we put up these lights around their pens that ward off the lions. And uh, uh, it's a win-win situation. The lions don't eat their cattle and they don't go out and have to kill the lions because they're eating their cattle. Um, 
these are the types of things that inspire young people. Uh, we don't need government grants. Uh, people learn about property rights, how to run and manage. We always say if we start these projects and we still have to give them money after two or three years, we failed. We want them to be projects where the people own and get ownership of them and carry them on for years to come. Very well said. I think instead of handouts, these are the things, tools and resources is what we need to provide to these countries uh, in order to sustain the benefits that you guys got. So you also have decades of experience, correct, providing expertise to a wide range of government, academic, media, and industry forums. And I've also seen you actually appear in media outlets. I think that's where I got most information about you and the work that you do. I, I saw you in the Wall Street Journal, CNN, USA Today, BBC, and so on and so forth. But uh, I I think what surprised me, some of these outlets I just mentioned are not very friendly to a balanced perspective. So how do you get onto these the, uh, media outlets and provide a balanced perspective and get your point across? What's the magic there? Well, in full disclosure, a lot of those outlets, if they're on the uh, left, they, they get us in there, but usually as that alternative voice, and they don't always paint what we say accurately. So I, uh, the fact that they report us doesn't mean they report us correctly. Sometimes it's even critically, uh, but we are able to at least get that, uh, that they, we always joke and say, if they spell our name correctly and more or less get what we're trying to say, we've scored points with them. Uh, the Wall Street Journal has been favorable, but uh, you know, places like uh, the Washington Post or something like that never generally <laughs> give us positive media. Uh, but they get, they do at least talk to us. Uh, our point of view is is that, uh, and I'll tell you where they generally get us. They get us with uh, some of our media spokesmen who are out there all the time. Mark Morano is probably the most acclaimed one. He's on he was on Tucker Carlson two nights ago. Uh, we have other people that uh, routinely get on the meet in the media, and um, a lot of times it's they'll phone us just asking for a comment. And uh, we'll give them a comment and uh, then they'll publish it and then they'll get about three people to criticize it. But uh, at, at least we're getting it out there and people know that there's an alternative point of view on things like what you see in the news every day. We're seeing, for example, these uh, farmers protesting out in uh, Holland or the Netherlands. And uh, you know this is all part of a sustainable development slash climate change agenda that's just gone crazy, not based in science. And uh, we need to get the message out there that those farmers are correct in protesting. And this has real ramifications for our food supply, has real ramifications for people's lives uh, as they continue to listen to the radical greens, uh, try and pursue objectives that uh, will benefit neither people or the planet. Absolutely. So, but uh, one of the interview, Craig, I heard you mention that CFACT is committed to educating the public and exposing global warming for what truly it is. You said it's a massive redistribution scheme. Do you mean to say that this massive redistribution scheme is not designed to strengthen the U.S. economy like the way they pretend to be, but it is? Is it to throttle it down? Can you kind of elaborate on that? Yeah, there's no question that the um, I have uh, I'm at CFAC, the organization I represent, is one of the few accredited NGOs to the UN climate forums. We also are to biodiversity and a couple others. And we've been sending delegates there for almost 30 years. I myself personally have been to about 27 of these UN meetings going back to the mid 1990s. Wow. Uh, having attended them, I can tell you. Uh, that at the core of what they're trying to do is establish uh, themselves as some sort of preeminent leader um, and dictating to the nations uh, their energy policies, their agricultural policies, um, their population policies, and, uh, and they're getting lots of money in the, in the same way. Uh, they require dues, but also have all these other funds that they manage, like, for example, the climate, the Green Climate Fund, you know, this is like a hundred billion dollars that the UN wants to take away from various countries so that they can reappropriate it uh, as they see fit. So I think all this weakens the United States, it, it lessens our sovereignty, and honestly, it's counterproductive because uh, the UN, for example, thinks one of the best things you can do to protect uh, the environment is to reduce human numbers. How do they do that? They fund a lot of abortion stuff all over the world, thinking that if we can somehow lessen the number of people, that's lessening the uh, impact of, on Mother Earth, when in fact people are a blessing to the Earth. And the most prosperous countries in the world are people, are countries filled with people 
because people are not just mouths, they also have a mind and two hands and tend to be very productive, not just consumers. I see how this is a vicious cycle, right? I, you can make start making connections of where these policies are kind of being choked on, choked on to us. So you just talked about United Nations. It's my understanding, as you said, you went there multiple times. I'm just curious to know how is your message received in UN, especially when you have these all goers, carries flying into UN in their private jets and Greta Thunberg's views being pushed aggressively in UN. So how is yours accepted? Well, they've they've grown to they've grown accustomed to us. Now, I'd say it's it's a it's an interesting love hate relationship. We'll put up a booth, for example, sometimes at the United Nations conference where we hand out materials that's totally contrary to everything else that's being handed out. You can always find our booth because there's laughter. People are happy, and uh, even if they disagree with us, they'll come over and at least talk to us. And uh, I, I think it comes because we have a positive outlook on on life, whereas a lot of our green adversaries think. The end is near, we're gonna die, or as AOC would say, the earth only has 12 years to left. There's no time to smile and be happy. But if you don't believe that, like we don't, we think we'll be fine in 2030, then that per changes your perspective on things. So uh, I don't think, I, I think on a personal level, a lot of them like us a lot. However, as an organization, um, they don't like us too much. I've actually been kicked out of a couple conferences, but always welcome back for some of the activities. And one of the reasons is we like to do stunts. You know, I think the last time I got kicked out was in 2017, shortly after Trump was in. We, we put up a big life-size uh, picture of Donald Trump and shredded the Paris Accord because he said he was gonna get us out of it. And uh, they wound up throwing us into the desert in Morocco. Uh, but the next year we were back. They apologized for that. They, <laughs> and the people that did that, uh, uh, we apologize. I mean, this is a type of street theater that is common there, but apparently if you're on the conservative side, they, it's, you know, not always welcome. You're very courageous. <laughs> you're very <laughs> courageous and you're out there with a the positive spirit that makes a huge difference. Uh, I think that's one thing that I tell about conservative spirits, right? We are always, especially living in this area, being conservative in itself is challenging, but having a positive outlook goes a long way. Uh, Craig, I think you spoke about this, but I know that uh, I wanted to get more information about this. You were involved in Adaptive Village Project or CFACT has been involved or Global Social Responsibility program and also you have a daily national radio commentary which is just the facts um, what are the projects that all of these are and what are the themes that you're discussing in just the facts hopefully our audience can tune into that radio commentary to kind of get more information about the policies it's actually changed names it's now called district of conservation but oh. uh, I, I gave you an older one but yes it's actually a podcast it's uh, now hosted by gabriella hoffman and uh, I'm not sure how many radio stations it's in, but uh, I do know it has a fairly good following on, uh, you know, through Apple. And uh, you can find a District of Conservation with Gabriella Hoffman. We have a, another program with her called Conservation Nation. We send her around uh, the country uh, to visit monuments, to go into places where there's a discussion of environmental issues. She did, just recently did one uh, on bears out in Yellowstone, uh, oh. where they're being... Uh, you know, and how they're being managed and the attacks uh, that are coming on our conservation leaders by environmentalists who say we're mismanaging them when in fact they're at record numbers. And, uh, you know, we uh, also have other programs. You mentioned the Collegians. We have the Adopt a Village program. Uh, we have a, a perhaps the biggest climate skeptic site on climate change. It's called climatedepot.com and would encourage everyone to go there. Uh, some of our people produce books as well uh, that you can get at our CFAC bookstore. And uh, we have a fairly active grassroots presence around the country. So uh, you, a lot of, we have thousands and thousands and thousands of uh, citizen members that receive our daily, uh, well, weekly emails and uh, get our newsletter. So, um, you know, we, get, we got a lot going on sometimes, I, though I'm the uh, president of the organization, I even forget all our different projects because uh, we just have so much going on. 
you ha you definitely have built an empire around this, which is uh, great <laughs> because you really need to get some alternating thoughts as well. So, uh, Craig, our energy and transportation secretaries, regardless of who is in that uh, state department, they insist that people need to rush out and buy this fifty-five thousand dollar electric cars and charge them up with expensive renew renewable energy to lower their carbon footprint. Uh, and um, how feasible or reasonable is that for middle class Americans? I always say I'm a middle class American mom, typically just running around with kids all day in my in a huge van where I can put my basketball stuff and my soccer stuff and so on. How feasible is it for average American to kind of evolve into these uh, electric cars? Well, and you know that you raise a good point. I think that the cost is prohibitive for a lot of people. You are looking at 55, 60, even hot going up from there. Uh, you have limited range. I think for a lot of people who like to travel, we just went to Pittsburgh to visit friends and uh, you'd have to stop for a 45, uh, you know, half hour, 45 minute recharge. Uh, your electricity bill goes up. Sometimes these batteries have to be replaced and they're several thousand dollars every few years. Um, you know, that they drive okay while you're driving them, no problem with that. Uh, on the other hand, you got to ask yourself, why is the government telling us we all have to buy these expensive cars that have limited range? They'll tell you it's because there's a climate crisis. And in our view, uh, they've been saying this. I've been around since the beginning of this crisis back in the late 80s, our so-called crisis. None of the things they predicted have ever come true. I've heard preposterous claims that by the year 2000, uh, New York City would be half underwater. Never happened. We had uh, climate uh, people saying in the uh, right after the year 2000, we'd have to tell our children within a decade that what snow is like, because they'll never see it. And uh, that, of course, never happened. We heard from AOC by 2030, the end of the world is coming, the end. Uh, well, we're well on our way there already, and I don't see really anything changing. Uh, on issue after issue, and I'd encourage people just to look up the data. We use government data, not our own data. And you'll see on issues like hurricanes, uh, tornadoes, uh, wildfires, all these things, we're within historic, historic norms on almost all these categories. So when people say we have to move to renewable energy, we have to move to electric cars, um, there's, it's because of a crisis that frankly is overblown. And even a lot of the people who were formerly on Obama's staff, like Steve Coonan, or Michael Schellenberger, who helped put in the first Green New Deal, are people now starting to wander away from that and now are becoming skeptics of some of these alarmist claims coming from climate uh, advocates. Absolutely, Greg. I said, if you're able to afford $55,000, car, go for it, good for you. But I think uh, insisting that uh, or making feel uh, making us feel guilty, just average American moms and American dads, I think is just unbelievable. Well, and here's the other thing, they, they call them environmental, but the number of precious metal, you got nickel, cadmium, uh, uh, copper, all these things are coming from developing countries where in many cases, well, some of it comes from China where they use slave labor. Other countries come where they use child labor. Uh, there are environmental conditions where these uh, minerals are extracted from to make the batteries are often appalling. And, uh, you know, from our perspective, are you really helping the environment? Leave alone that once these batteries are exhausted, you have mounds of toxic waste. And all these wind farms and solar farms that are going up all over the country, they have a life expectancy in many cases, about 20 years, you're going to have to replace them all. Then what do you do with them? There's a recycling problem. There isn't really any infrastructure to care for these things. So we're finding that actually, oh, leave alone another one, the amount of habitat of animals that are, are impacted by these farms is just tremendous. We're currently in a lawsuit off the coast of Virginia where they're putting up these wind farms that are right in the path of the right whale. It's actually called the right whale. There's about 300 of them left. And uh, if they put these wind farms up, this is devastating. To that, to those whales. So it's not environmentally friendly. I think you bring up a very good point. I don't think many people are thinking about what do we do if you need to recycle all of this in twenty years, right? I mean, all of exactly. this has in the last five, ten years. But what happens in after ten years when that car can't be used anymore? That's a great point. You just talked about Virginia. Let's talk about our own Virginia, uh, climate and economic policies. I mean, what is Governor Youngkin's position on all of this? Do you kind of uh, keep a tab on what his policies are, and how is that going for Virginia? Yeah, I think I think he's a, a solid governor. Certainly, a great improvement over the last one. Uh, 
he came out against our involvement in something called REGI, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, and stated his opposition to that, which is a costly uh, program where states band together to limit the, their energy choices. It drives up costs on consumers. Um, and I think he uh, you know, has stated his opposition to that and also pointed out something that was passed by uh, Northam and the last uh, uh, governor of the Virginia Clean Economy Act, which is just abysmal. If this thing goes into operation, uh, you know, we're gonna see prices soar in Virginia. So uh, we've been working with some of his people to uh, try to roll that back and put some reason into it. Uh, as I mentioned about the whales off the coast of Virginia, this is something that um, we're hoping the administration will support. We would like to launch a lawsuit to protect these whales and, um, in Dominion Energy, honestly, it seems to be in bed with the uh, Democratic Party in the state, and they're plowing over vast stretches of Virginia wilderness to put in big solar units, despite residents across the state, like in Fredericksburg, who are opposing it. And uh, I know he, uh, this is concerns the governor, and it's our hope that uh, uh, as he has voiced during his campaign, what we've seen from him thus far, he will come out on the side of the citizens uh, and try and stop some of these things. Greg, you're right. We have a solid governor, obviously, uh, just a, a quite, a quite different from what we had for the past four years. So this has been a good year for us. Uh, I also would strongly encourage you to kind of talk to our candidates. I mean, there are plenty of candidates. I'm just not really sure if they all uh, rightfully so understand the details and extent of uh, climate policies that you're talking about. I think it would be great for you to sit down with our candidates once in a while to kind of elaborate on the policies. Well, um, I think so. And some of them, like Winsome Sears, for example, I understand she was on your program. Uh, we knew her. My wife went to a Bible study with her and uh, they were friends before any of this happened. And we've been supporting her for years. Um, you know, I think her instincts are solid. And, uh, you know, and so I think there's a good circle of people around him as well uh, that are going the right direction. So we're very encouraged by what we're seeing in Virginia. And, God has uh, been great with God. God truly has been good to us this year. Yeah, Hopefully it'll continue. <laughs> it'll continue. So Craig, it is true. Is it true that, I mean, I did this somewhere and I thought you're the best person that has balanced perspective could tell me this. Is it true that even if United States and combined Britain, Europe, Canada, and Australia totally eliminated fossil fuels, it wouldn't make a big, uh, much difference for global carbon dioxide and greenhouse gas emissions. Instead, obviously, if you totally eliminate fossil fuels, you're going to destroy the economy, jobs, and living standards for nothing. But is that true, or is that just uh, a, another myth? No, that is absolutely true. And in fact, what you would find is that uh, it will still go up. And the reason for that, I apologize. Right. <laughs> I'm going to turn off my phone here. Uh, the reason for that is because- You're a busy guy. I'm glad you, you're spending some time with us this evening. Well, I just am surprised at myself that I didn't turn this off. So I will uh, do so now. So anyway, uh, what I was gonna say was the uh, reason for that is, is because India and China, uh, I know you're from India, are, uh -huh. are fully blown and committed to increasing their fossil fuel use. In truth, we don't really criticize them for that, except for this one point. Uh, they are urging the United States and Western Europe and Australia to cut their emissions while at the same time they're increasing theirs. So the hypocrisy bothers us. Um, but the fact that they're not going along with the Paris Accord, which is to limit it, I don't blame them. They shouldn't. Uh, uh, so I, in my opinion, we've seen uh, where the United States was a leader in uh, carbon dioxide emissions up until about nah, seven, eight years ago. And uh, now they're being totally taken away by, uh, uh, you know, some of these developing world countries, which is interesting that the United Nations is okay with that. You never hear anything about it. Meanwhile, uh, when, when we are actually were declining under Donald Trump, not because of any signing on the Paris Accord, but because of the, the increased use of natural gas, and that was made possible through fracking, all you heard was criticism from the Greens about the United States when we were leading the world in carbon emissions reductions. So, you know, I, I, I think that the uh, objective here is less to do with protecting the planet from a so-called impending climate catastrophe than it is in advancing uh, big government and advancing uh, taxes against industries they don't like and enriching certain uh, corporate leaders that are sympathetic to the Democratic Party 
and uh, certain people at the United Nations who have a, a what they call a, a big globalist mindset as to how they can enrich themselves at the expense of those in the West. Absolutely, Craig. I think uh, hypocrisy is a good word to use and uh, bloating of the government only benefits so, some people. It doesn't benefit 90% of uh, Americans by any means. So Craig, uh, you have been in the industry sp space for 30 years. You've provided expertise to a wide range of government, academic, media, and industry firms. Do you think the public is more aware of what's going on right now with this climate change world well, now better than when you started off? Do you feel like with the exposure to, or is it so polarized that people know less about what the truth is now than 30 years back? I'm just curious to know what did each decade you feel like, oh, this is getting better. Or is it like, oh boy, this is even more polarized. You know, there's a little bit of both. I would say, uh, you know, attitudes really have been fairly polarized for a while on this. Uh, it's a very much a Democrat Republican divide on this. And so I would say that, uh, you know, we've made some progress uh, in terms of educating people. I think when you look at some of the polls out there and you ask them on an issue like climate change, where's that rank in your major issues that you're concerned about? In the United States, it's down near the bottom. If there's, you know, seven, eight, nine issues, it's seventh, eighth or ninth, you know, behind the legal immigration, behind, you know, war on terror, behind, you know, high fuel prices, the economy. You know, so it's not one of these top tier issues as it is, for example, in Europe uh, or another or Australia, where they just had an election and it tends to be a much higher priority. And so we take credit for that, not just ourselves, but our allies as well, in trying to do something about that and educate the American people. Uh, unfortunately, I would say that where it's starting to make an impact is among younger people. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is because of the education system. Uh, a lot of young kids are terrified. In fact, they have growing things called eco-anxiety that psychologists call it because kids are being force fed that they're all going to die. And teachers are telling them that there'll be no more polar bears left. There'll be no more future for you. And your parents are selfish because they're chewing up all the goods and you, you have a very bleak future. That, hence, you see somebody like Greta Thunberg, for example, who actually couldn't eat for a while because uh, she's been terrorized by the public school system about climate change. And this concerns us because this is having an impact among uh, some younger people uh, that are buying into this. And uh, so the future, we got to be cautious about. We got to start uh, making some more inroads and getting some materials out there, which we're busy doing uh, to try and uh, offset some of this propaganda being fed our kids. Greg, every single day I hear a new word from that liberal community. I say, I've never heard the word echo anxiety. <laughs> now, as you say, it just makes sense. I think uh, uh, that is there. I mean, the kids are terrified of their bleak future. And I'm like, it's not bleak. I mean, the country is a developed country. We can handle this crisis. So it's just. Well, and we interviewed some of these. Now, one of the things CFAC's done and we're somewhat known for is we put out two movies. One was called Climate Hustle and the other was called Climate Hustle 2. Uh, the first one uh, went out in 2016, and it was in about 400 theaters, and it was the number one movie for one night. We beat My Big Fat Greek Wedding 2 and Batman versus Superman. So the competition wasn't that great, but we did beat them, and we were the number one movie. It had uh, uh, Sarah Palin at that time helping to promo it. Uh, Climate Hustle 2 uh, came out about a year ago, uh, or a year and a half ago, about a year ago, and it's available on our website. It stars Kevin Sorbo. And uh, what we did is we went in and uh, uh, explored various aspects. The first movie dealt with the science. So if you're heavy on the science and want to find out why we don't think we're headed to a climate apocalypse, Climate Hustle One's your movie. The other was the motivations and some of the dangers that the Greens are putting out there. Why would the Greens want to hustle us? And we looked at the children in the classroom. So we have an excellent section in that movie where we talk to people who are very concerned about eco-anxiety and showing some of the propaganda that's being done on the kids. And I would encourage people to look at Climate Hustle 2 uh, by coming to cfac.org and, and, and maybe getting their copy today. Oh, I, I, I'm glad you did something in the movie sphere. I think I always feel like media entertainment uh, is better for the kids to learn. It's like a nice cultural diplomacy. I'm surprised Kevin Sorbo, Hollywood star, just, uh, wanted to do it. Not because I don't think they're great movies or the producer such as you is great to work with. It's just Hollywood is really not into this at all. So I'm just uh, thrilled to know that um, you were able to convince somebody as uh, 
acclaimed as Kevin Sorbo to do your film. <laughs> uh, he's a wonderful guy. Yeah, we've gotten to be, uh, you know, somewhat friends and, uh, and uh, working together. If we do another film, which we might call Climate Hustle 3, The Great Reset, uh, he would be on the short list of those to host it again. He did such a fantastic job. Our vision in making these movies, by the way, is, <laughs> our fear was that they would be boring. So we wanted to make sure uh, that they were entertaining. So when you watch this, you're not just watching some boring documentary of people's heads talking and you kind of yawn. A lot of our clips are actually poking fun at what the other side's saying in their own way words, catching them. So we use a lot of humor in it. We call it edutainment. That is, it's educational, but also entertaining. And uh, I think uh, you'd be impressed if you saw it. So we uh, encourage you to look into it. And, uh, you know, we're getting requests all the time. It was just shown on Newsmax uh, two months ago. Cool. Very cool. I'm going to ask my 20 year old to watch because they're fed all kinds of stuff in the university. I can tell you that. So, uh, so Craig, I know you represented at the 26th session of the Conference of the Parties. Or was that in Glasgow, um, Scotland? You asked uh, someone to comment about scientific uh, findings, which shows that increased carbon emission actually boosts crop yields, which have led to ho record harvest for feeding the world. So right. that just tells CO2 isn't just a problem, but it is actually benefiting to helping feed the world. So what did panelists say? I, I, I mean, I think I heard that, I read that, and I was like, I wish I was uh, just fly on the wall to see how did panelists respond to that? And what do they have to say to that? Well, when we give them facts like that, they, uh, they tend to just shake their head and go like, how could, you know, it's so contrary to what they're hearing, but it's factually correct. We are breaking records uh, in terms of harvest. Uh, we aren't experiencing more drought. And, uh, you know, so yes, it's viewed with skepticism. I kind of say, when you're on a, you know, it's a lot to take in. If you've been on a grid, this certain grid for a while, to all of a sudden go the other way, you usually have to hear it from two or three people. So uh, our hope is, is that they'll hear the same information from other sources, and not be dismissive down the road. I was just happy to make it out of England, having driven on you know the wrong side of the road for two weeks and not uh, being a victim of uh, you know some accident. It was, uh, I think that was the biggest challenge being over there. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. I mean, that's how we drive back home in India too. But now if I go back, I don't think I can drive at all, at all. So, Craig, I think you briefly spoke about President Trump. I'm kind of trying to recollect what was the context, but you were also a signatory to an American Energy Alliance letter to President Donald Trump supporting the safe, affordable, fuel-efficient vehicle rule. Correct. Um, so how was that received by the Trump administration? Uh, Trump's people were excellent. Uh, in fact, to me, he's the boldest, greatest visionary. Uh, of course, I'm from the Reagan era, so Ronald Reagan will always be, I'll be partial to, but... Uh, you know, Trump was truly a, a great president, and uh, he actually uh, liked our movie. He gave, he tweeted it out, Climate Hustle 2, which we were proud of, and uh, I found him to be just uh, superb on not just uh, the Safe Affordable uh, Act, but also on a whole host of things. Getting out of Paris was a tremendous boon to us. His uh, efforts on fracking and uh, unleashing American independence are second to none. I mean, we, we always talk about happy and America dependent uh, from foreign sources of oil. He's the first president since Harry Truman that actually succeeded in getting America to be that energy rich. And as Americans are understanding right now with the uh, high gas prices we're facing, we didn't have those under Donald Trump. There's a reason. It has to do with the fact he unleashed American energy dominance. Uh, we were became a net exporter of oil under his uh, tenure. And uh, you, now you have Biden out there who's uh, his greatest thing he can do is say that he unleashed the strategic petroleum reserve, a reserve that was filled under Donald Trump. And now we find out about 100 million barrels of it went to China. So yeah. uh, it's been a complete disaster uh, on his front. He seems to be committed to this climate agenda, even in the face of high fuel prices. And this is deliberate, uh, even his own people say, in order to make solar, wind, and some of these renewables or electric cars uh, a reasonable choice uh, to consumers, you could do one of two things. One is you can take the high cost of the electric vehicles and lower them to the level that the, uh, you know, that the other cars are. Or the other one is, is if you know, renewables are at this point, raise the prices of all the regular traditional cars and the gasoline and everything through taxes, you know, gas shortages and the like, and now it becomes competitive. He's chosen the latter. He wants to 
you know, up the cost of our conventional energy sources so that we're forced, you know, to consider electric cars. Craig, the word that you use, deliver it, uh, makes me feel like uh, average American uh, who are spending $4.99 at this point does not appreciate that at all from Team Biden. I say their entire focus on climate crisis when uh, things are so bad out in the economy. And as you said, those two options, they chose to just raise the prices. And, and I think no, none of this is going to solve the climate crisis anyway, because there isn't a crisis, you know, and so that's the biggest thing. And if he was really committed, let's suppose you buy in and say, you know, you're hearing me for the first time saying it's not a major crisis. But let's suppose you're one of those who say, you know, I'm hearing too much that it is a crisis. There's a much more affordable alternative. Go nuclear. Nuclear yeah. emits no greenhouse gases. But you know what the Greens position is on nuclear? They're against it. Mm. And you go like, OK, so now you got bountiful electricity at a cost competitive price that could allow us to have a strong economy and you guys are opposed to it. Why? You know, it makes no sense, but uh, it's because they have another agenda. Uh, Craig, I think I hope our audience catch on to two points that you mentioned. One is uh, strategic re uh, reserves that you talked about, what Biden released uh, actually were from Trump era. And the second thing was he was the one that filled. And second thing is uh, uh, we are struggling with the prices and uh, uh, millions of barrels are being shipped outside of the United States. So it's just really doesn't make sense. Um, yeah, I hope that, that's probably news to a lot of people because everybody thought that this was meant for Americans. And it is supposed to be to lower our prices. They give some convoluted reason that they say, well, if it floods the world market and drops everybody's prices, I go, yeah, but not that much. If you're putting that little amount of oil into a global economy, that does almost nothing for prices. So it does, even using their own logic, it doesn't help with gas prices. 100%, 100%. So Craig, I know you congratulated President Trump for rolling back corporate average fuel economy standards and urging him not to cut a deal with California to allow them to operate with separate regulations. Did Trump adapt to that? Did he consider that? Yes, he did. As a matter of fact, he did. Uh, he actually was one of the, perhaps the first president I remember anyway, that actually lowered the corporate average fuel economy uh, and did not have it go as high as what Biden wants at over 50 miles per gallon. The reason for this is because of the fact that uh, it really doesn't do anything to cure pollution or anything of that sort. It makes cars smaller and less safe. And there's been bountiful studies that have been done out there that shows as cars get smaller, uh, they're less safe for consumers. It limits uh, consumer choice. And a lot of people don't want to be in these small cars uh, because they have families and uh, they, you know, trucks and that sort of thing struggle to get these. And, you know, there's not always a technology fix. If you just keep up in the standards like that, eventually we're all going to drive, you know, uh, smart cars. And I'm, I'm not sure that that's in the interest of the consumer or, or people in general. Did you publish an article in the Boston Herald or Inside Sources uh, arguing against tax incentives for electric vehicles? Was that part of this uh, discussion? It was. I think it was in Energy Central. But uh, yes, I did. I, it was basically my position that the uh, uh, these tax incentives are not going to things that are improving the environment. I've mentioned before the batteries. I've mentioned before the uh, 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 smaller cars. I, I mentioned before that these tax incentives also um, have been in place for a long time. If you wanted to give these industries a little leg up for a short term, I, I could live with that. But it's now been a long time and people just aren't buying them. The technology hasn't been there that have dropped the price of these things. In fact, they're going up in price. So I think enough is enough. If you're going to compete, you should compete on a level playing field. If electric, electric cars are really the way of the future, let them compete on a level playing field with the conventional vehicles and make a better product that goes further and uh, scores better with the consumers rather than have a government-induced transition, uh, which never goes well. Absolutely. Craig, every increase in fossil fuel, you know, drives up the current, what is it, 9.1, 9.2% annual inflation rate right now for everything we grow, make, buy and eat. Uh, I, I guess most Americans understand that. I, I hope they do. What, what do you think it takes Biden administration to understand that, that this is literally killing all of us and not only killing more jobs, it's reducing our health and living standards even further, especially for middle class to poor American families. I know no, you're doing your I, best. I, I, <laughs> what else can we do to make the Biden administration understand that? 
Uh, you know, I am not certain they are a committed ideological administration, much like Obama was before them, uh, that seems to have uh, set its course in a way that I'm not sure that very much, if anything, is going to change their mind on this. I think they're going to have to hopefully feel the results at the, at the polls this coming uh, November. And if, in fact, things go as it appears they may, uh, they'll have no choice but to amend what they're going for. Right now, uh, we can thank uh, Senator uh, Joe Manchin for standing in the way of some absolutely horrible laws. He just did it again today uh, by not signing on to any sort of climate legislation that's gonna go through all but killing any hopes for massive spending on some of these uh, boondoggle programs that the administration had in mind for their uh, Green New Deal that they wanted to put through. So. You know, I think short of uh, defeating them at the polls, there's, there's almost no way that this administration is going to change course. Uh, Craig, I'm glad you brought up the midterm elections. I was wondering, uh, do you think midterm elections will play a role in determining whether America's living standards and freedom of speech lives on? I mean, Absolutely. I can't wait for midterms to uh, come in. Absolutely. As I say, I'm, we're optimistic, but you should never count your uh, chickens before they're hatched. But, uh, you know, I've been, I'm old enough, I've seen some disappointments come around, but I've also seen some unexpected surprises. Uh, but I think people have had enough. I think this uh, administration is just, uh, you know, uh, you can thank them for probably what will be majorities in both houses against them. And uh, the reason for that is the high energy costs, which are the natural consequence of what they've been pursuing. And uh, the high food prices, you know, as they attack and do pretty much a war on farm, farming, uh, you see just the uh, inept foreign policy leadership. And uh, you have Biden out there begging for oil from some of our adversaries. Uh, this is not uh, an administration that's strong. It's not an administration that's looking to uh, what's best for the American people. It's one that's committed to a radical green agenda and you know, the hell with every, everybody else that uh, and what they suffer, uh, we're going to plow through with what we want to do. Greg, thank you so much. This has been so insightful. Some of the questions are questions that I was more curious to understand. And thank you for your time and patience in not only answering the questions, but also elaborating in the policy stances of CFAC. Um, as we are coming to the end of this program, I can't believe it's already 15 minutes. The, I think you were so prompt. You were so timely in kind of uh, uh, speaking, I, I can't believe I asked you about close to 18 questions, which usually doesn't happen. You're so comprehensive, articulate, and crisp with your responses. It was just a bundle of knowledge packed in 15 minute session. So in the last minute, do, did I miss anything that you would feel like, oh, I really want to tell the audience about this? Well, I would say that the last thing I'd like to say is people should be optimistic and hopeful. Uh, while on the one hand, you have one side that's preaching gloom and doom, the end is near, or is Alexandria Cortez says we have 12 years left. Um, you know, they've been defeated in the past. Uh, we've gone through many battles with these guys through the years. And ultimately, the common sense of the American people return, especially when they are suffering the prices. I also am old enough to have lived through the gas prices of the late 1970s. Uh, and uh, it was pretty dire then with double digit employment, double digit interest rates, double digit inflation. And then we had Ronald Reagan. And uh, we then ushered in great prosperity for a long time. And, uh, you know, so from my perspective, I, I, I think that the best days are ahead. Hence the name of our organization, Committee for a Constructive Tomorrow. I think that uh, we should not go to bed in fear. We should not teach our children the end is near. Uh, they should have an optimistic future to look forward to. And I think we can turn this corner and hopefully remember both the Biden and the Obama administration is nothing but a bad dream. Craig, fantastic, fantastic. That was an amazing summary. No gloom and doom. I think we can get through this. And uh, in the crisis, Reagan came through. So hopefully in the next crisis, we'll have another Reagan come through. So viewers, as you can see, constructive for, uh, I'm sorry, uh, CFAT, I, I'm so used to saying it as CFAT, it has been termed invaluable by the Arizona Republic. It has been lauded for its effort to bring in sound science to the environmental debate by a former president of the National Academy of Sciences. It has also been praised by a respected um, Boston um, Herald co uh, columnist for a record of supplying absolutely solid information. That's what Craig did in the last 15 minutes. He brought in the facts, uh, very balanced facts and solid information. I thank you, Craig, for coming in and sharing the knowledge and your expertise in conversations that count that is supported by Fairfax GOP. 
Thank you, Sri. It was a pleasure being on your program. Thank you. Dear viewers, next week on Friday, July 22nd at 6 p.m., we'll have Stephen Sutton. He's a senior vice president in Leadership Institute in order to discuss about training and mentoring the next generation of conservative leaders. Hope you all can tune in. I also will be having a walkathon tomorrow at 9 a.m. in Fairfax to support our candidates. We're going to be doing some door knocking, postcard writing, some phone calls in order to support our common sense candidates of uh, 11th Congressional District, who is Jim Miles, 10th Congressional District, who is Hang Kao. Both will be in Fairfax. If you're interested in joining the walkathon, please message here on Fairfax GOP Messenger, and I will send you all the details. I thank you for joining us this evening, and uh, I wish you a continue to tune into our other shows as well. God bless you all and God bless America. Have a happy weekend. Thank you.